The chocolate chip cookie is possibly the most famous cookie ever invented. And you would think that it's an old, very old cookie, but it's not. It was invented in 1938, and the inventor was... The Atari 7800 Game by Game Podcast. On today's episode, we will be covering the Absolute Games AM0390404 Kung Fu Master and AV04104 Title Match Pro Wrestling. What you gonna do when the 7800 Pro System runs wild over you? guys welcome to the podcast my name is blah 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 i'm your host okay let's get this party started it has been a crazy week so i am ready to get things done so i'm going to kind of rush through the intro today uh first of all i wanted to touch on something from the last episode which covered joust and galaga i realized after the episode i never gave you my thoughts on the game and how i would rate them And I would rate both of them a solid game. Neither one is quite a Hall of Fame game for me. And for me personally, Galaga would get the slight edge. Very interesting when I was looking at feedback. It seemed that people either really favored one or the other. It wasn't too close. They either really liked Joust better or Galaga better. It's kind of interesting. One of those kind of divisive pairings, if you will. Uh, I know a lot of people like Joust. It's closer to the arcade. I pick Galaga because I find it simpler and easier to play. Joust is a little more difficult dealing with the momentum. But I think both games are solid and both are worthy additions to your 7800 library. Uh, Today I want to talk just a little bit about um, third party games. And just an interesting uh, thing about it before we get to the history of Absolute and whatnot. Did you know that in America... The Atari 7800 Pro system had more third-party support than the Sega Master System. Now, if you're across the pond, this would sound absurd to you because the Sega Master System was just insanely popular just about anywhere but North America. But over here, yeah, the 7800 had a few more games. A total of 10 because you had Frogo, who made two games. Uh, Absolute, who we'll be talking about today, made six games. And Activision had two titles, Rampage and Double Dragon, that they brought over to the system. Now, um, it's not a lot of games, but it is more than what Sega Master System had. And this is probably due to what the Nintendo did as far as wrangling up third-party guys and making sure they only made games for them. But the Sega Master System did have some support. It had um, some support from Parker Brothers, who brought over uh, King's Quest... Where in the world is Carmen San Diego, I believe, and um, and uh, and Montezuma's Revenge? I think those were the three from uh, Parker Brothers. Uh, Activision was a pretty big uh, supporter. They had Rampage, which they also brought over to the seventy eight hundred and the twenty six hundred. They had Galaxy Force, which is real interesting because Galaxy Force was originally a Sega game in the arcade. But Activision published it on the Sega system. And what's even crazier is that an Activision game, Ghostbusters, was published by Sega for their system. So it's like they traded games or something weird. They also made Cyber Hunter and Bomber Raid. And then there was a a company called Seismic, probably most famous for bringing Musha to the Sega Genesis. They brought a game called RC Grand Prix, which was programmed by Absolute. So kind of interesting how it all ties together. So they had a total of eight games. Uh, The Atari 7800 had 10. So who knew that the 7800 actually had more third party support? Both of the, 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 you know, both of the systems didn't really have much thanks to Nintendo. I'll say this, though. The one cool thing about the third party support on the Sega Master System was they had some pretty cool boxes. And now that I think of it, I think for the most part, the 7800 has some cool boxes, too. I just like it when boxes are different from the standard fare. And so I appreciate seeing different box art and whatnot. But there you go. That's it for the intro today. Let's go ahead and go straight to the games. Before I get to the games, I thought it'd be interesting to go over the company Absolute Entertainment itself. In an interview with Gary Kitchen, Atarian Magazine, Issue 2, on pages 4 and 5, I found some interesting facts. Absolute was founded in 1986. Gary founded it along with his brothers, who are very talented as well, Steve and Dan. 
According to Gary, he and his brothers decided to start Absolute after the crash hit Activision in 1984, where he was working at the time. They did some research and they found out that there was still a market for new 2600 titles. Their first two titles, Skateboarding and Title Match Pro Wrestling for the Atari 2600, apparently sold pretty well. They also apparently had a deal where they made games and Activision distributed them. This most likely explains why the cartridges are basically Activision cartridges with the Activision logo blocked out. And also why there are some promo materials that include both Activision and Absolute games that were included with some cartridges. According to the interview, Absolute also worked on a consulting basis on some other titles, including the 2600 version of Kung Fu Master and the 7800 adaptions of Ace of Aces, Fight Night, Touchdown Football, and Crossbow. The first two games for the 7800 was Super Skateboarding and F-18 Hornet, but I'm going by the part numbers, so we'll cover those at a later time. At the time of the interview, Absolute employed 14 people, plus had an additional 6 to 7 people consulting with them. The core of Absolute was him, his brothers, Alex DeMio, and David Crane, one of the founders of Activision and the guy who created the wonderful game Pitfall. And he said it took about 3 to 6 months to fully develop a game. They lasted until 1995. In 1989, they expanded when it looked like basically that the Atari 7800 was no longer going to be financially viable. And some notable titles included Boy and His Blob on the NES and the Super Battle Tank series on the SNES. They also did some Sega CD games, including uh, Penn & Teller's Smoke and Mirrors, which never came out, but it featured the infamous or infamous Desert Bus game. Their last game was a 3DO version of Rise of the Robots, and I guess that's probably not a bad, that's probably actually not a not a good game to get into. That would be a uh, company killer, at least it sounds like it would be. I never played it. Most of them went on to work for Skyworks Technology, which I believe Gary founded after Absolute closed the doors, but that company was sold off to another guy in 2007. So it's still around today, but it's no longer uh, affiliated with uh, Gary Kitchen or any of the guys from Absolute. And now they basically make iPhone games and internet games and stuff like that. Now, one thing that is interesting is there was a phone book rumor that when Activision was founded, they purposely named their company Activision so that it would be listed ahead of Atari in the phone book. And coming up with the company called Absolute kind of lends some validity to this rumor because now Absolute would be ahead of Activision, which would be ahead of Atari. So just some interesting uh, kind of Easter egg information there. Kung Fu Master itself was based on a 1984 arcade game that was made by Irem in Japan. And over here it was brought to the States in the arcade by Data East. IREM began in 1974 as IPM, or International Plane Machines. Their first arcade game was a Space Invader clone called IPM Invaders in 1978. In 1979, they changed their name to IREM Corporation, which stood for International Rental Electronic Machines. Later on, they changed it to stand for Innovations in Recreational Electronic Media. In the 1990s, they added a dragonfly to their logo, which represents success, but this was kind of ironic because sales began to decline, and in 1994, they stopped developing games, so they probably should have left the dragonfly off. In 1997, another, I believe it was a Japanese company named Nanoa, founded a new IREM that absorbed the old and focused on various PlayStation consoles in Japan. IREM was known for their difficult arcade games. Some popular titles included Moon Patrol, 10-Yard Fight, and of course, the R-Type series. Kung Fu Master is actually based on a 1984 Hong Kong movie, Wheels on Meals, starring Jackie Chan. So yeah, the guy in all these versions of Kung Fu, Kung Fu Masters, is supposed to be Jackie Chan. He plays a guy named Thomas, who teams with a fast food van co-worker and a private eye to rescue a girl they meet named Sylvia, who gets kidnapped by a criminal gang and is held in the castle because she is an heir to a fortune, it turns out. It was also called Spartan X in Japan. That's why if you try and find the Famicom version of Kung Fu in Japan, it will be called Spartan X. 
Kung Fu Master has you punching and kicking your way through five floors of a castle. Now, each floor contains various bad guys with a boss at the end. The first level, you start at the right and you scroll to the left, but at the end of each level, you climb a staircase, and then the next level will start on the opposite side. So, level two starts on the left and scrolls to the right, and it keeps on switching all the way through level five. If you beat the boss on the fifth level, you get to save the girl, at least until the game restarts. Kung Fu Master is often credited for helping start the beat-em-up genre. It was produced by Takashi Nishiyama. Hopefully I said that somewhat correctly. He also came up with Moon Patrol, the original Street Fighter, and later ran SNK's video game division and helped create the Neo Geo arcade system and some of the more popular fighting games Fatal Fury, Samurai Showdown, among others. Kung Fu Master had a spiritual successor in 1988's Vigilante that has similar gameplay and allowed you to pick up nunchucks, so it added the pick up a weapon feature that wasn't previously there. Kung Fu Master was also ported to the Atari 2600 and the NES, but on the NES it's just known as Kung Fu. There was also a Kung Fu Master for Game Boy that was similar in style, but was a completely different game. There was also a sequel just for the Famicom called Spartan X2. Kung Fu Master was probably released in 1989 for the Atari 7800. Now, just to give you kind of an idea of what's going on in 1989 and, and just help you realize how, la- how long the 7800 was lasting, this is the same year that the Sega Genesis came out. And it's the same year that Revenge of Shinobi came out. So if you had a Sega Genesis and an Atari 7800, you could choose whether you're going to buy Kung Fu Master or Revenge of Shinobi. And I'll t- I can tell you which one I would go with. Now, I don't have a box for my copy. I don't have a box for any of the Absolute games, but I did own some as uh, a kid. And if memory serves me right, they are slightly larger than your typical Atari 7800 box. I don't know how much larger, but they kind of were almost the size of some of the computer boxes uh, during that time. Some of the smaller ones, some of the computer boxes could be really huge. But the the box art looks a lot like the 2600 version of the box art, except instead of a black border, they have a red border. Personally, I like the black border better, but it's basically the same thing, except it also has a little uh, thing that says Super Graphics for the Atari 7800. You have Kung Fu Master in the middle. You have Thomas kicking a thug on the bottom section. And on the top, you have what looks to be like some sort of wizard because he has this orb glowing. He's doing the it's good kind of field goal motion with his arms. He raises both arms up and right at his belly is this glowing orb. You can see Sylvia in a red dress tied up and gagged. And you can see this gigantic green dragon staring over the balcony with really tiny wings. And it's kind of interesting because even though there are kind of dragons in the game, there's it makes it look like it's this huge monstrous boss. And, and that's definitely not the case. On the back, you only have one small screenshot. You do have the Data East logo. So that's kind of interesting there. Uh, the, the, the screenshot looks like it's cropped. It looks like it's missing part of the screen. And it kind of does a dis- disservice, especially when on the front you say Super Graphics for the Atari 7800. The back says Kung Fu Master, the arcade hit with super graphics for the 7800 in yellow and then in white it says you are the kung fu master the only one worthy to meet and overcome the challenges that await within the deadly wizard's temple but before you come eye to eye with the evil one you must use your martial arts skills and quick wit to conquer an army of demons dragons henchmen knife throwers and flying acrobats each floor holds different challenges defeat all the enemies to reach the top level There you'll have to battle the mighty wizard to rescue the princess, but work fast. Your princess is hopefully fearing for her life and yours. So they're changing Sylvia into a princess. And yeah, that is the box for it. Now the manuals were pretty cheaply done. They were all in black and white. So for this manual, you have a black cover in back and Kung Fu Master in white. I'm guessing it's a staple manual uh, with eight total pages. 
On the first page, it tells you that the gorgeous Princess Victoria is imprisoned in the evil wizard's temple. As Kung Fu Master, you must free her. Unfortunately, the temple's five torturous levels are seething with menacing foes. Smash your way through one level and start the next with renewed energy meter and timer. Once you free your princess, it's back to the beginning where your foes return faster and nastier. So actually, that's a pretty good description. It also tells you that you can uh, select one or two players. Of course, two players is alternating. It also has a page that describes everything you see on screen, like your score, your timer, your energy bar, your enemy's energy bar, your lives, and the floor indicator. And it notes that when you run out of energy, you you lose your life and you basically have to start the level over again. And of course, if if the time runs out, you lose life too. But that never happened to me when I played the game. Next up is your moves. To move right or left, move the joystick right or left. Duh. To jump, push the joystick forward. Now, this might be confusing because sometimes when you think forward, you think like you're going towards your enemy. But what they mean when they say forward is up. So you push your joystick up to jump, down to squat. To kick high, you have to move your joystick right or left and press the button. To kick low, you have to pull your joystick uh, back and press You have to put your joystick down. They say pull your joystick back, which makes me think like you have to put it away from your enemy. But you actually have to hold down and press the button. To punch high, you have to push the the joystick diagonally towards the enemy, diagonally up, and hit the button. And to punch low, you have to pull the joystick diagonally back. This This is just really confusing. To punch low, you have to crouch, and you have to be diagonally down, and then push the button. And then to break the henchman's hold, you have to jiggle your joystick from side to side. So this is one of the things about the game that utterly confuses me. The Atari 7800 was a two-button controller console system. So you had two buttons you could use, but they only used one, even though you had punching and kicking. And this can be very frustrating. You really have to get used to this. So again, if you want to kick... You have to just press towards your enemy or just duck down. But if you want to punch, you have to be diagonally either up or down towards your enemy, depending if you want to do a crouching or standing punch. And sometimes the punches are worth more, but we'll get there. So here we have the points. So for the henchman, you get 100 points per kick and 200 per per punch. For the knife thrower, you get 500 per kick and 800 per punch. For the midgets, you get 200 per kick, 300 per punch. For the killer moths, you get 500 per kick and 600 per punch, but I found it very difficult to hit the moths. Everybody else is worth the same whether you kick or punch. So Dragon Balls uh, is worth 2,000. I don't think they're talking about the anime. Stick Fighter, and they're not talking about a guy who looks like a stick figure. That would be hilarious, a stick fighter that looks like a stick figure. I think they made a game of that. Anyways, the Stick Fighter, that's your first boss, is worth 2,000 points. The Boomerang Thrower is 3,000. The Giant Kicker is 3,000. The Lightning Magician is 5,000, and the Gang Master is 10,000. So I guess they they talk about like the wizard being the bad guy, and the only guy who sounds like a wizard is the Lightning Magician. He's the boss of the fourth level, but the Gang Master is on the fifth level, so kind of weird how they worded that. Any time left at the end of the level is multiplied by 10 and added to your score energy. Any energy left at the end of levels multiplied by 100 and add to your score. You can win an extra life at 75,000 points. Good luck! And I think that's the only life you can, I think you can only earn one life. Final words to the wise. Don't punch or kick without reason. A true Kung Fu master strikes quickly and carefully. Find your enemy's weak spot. Learn what kind of blow hurts each foe the most. Don't battle snakes or spinning bobs, the bombs. The best you can do is stay out of their way. So yeah, those snakes can be a real pain. Actually, any of the, of the non-human enemies are a pain. No single enemy blow can kill you. You are a master after all. How Each blow, however, does deplete your energy and makes you weak. The right blow at the wrong time can kill you. Watch your timer when it runs out, one life is lost. And I'll add that when enemies grab you, uh, it can take energy quickly. And the worst is the knife throwers, who in this version, they can come right up to you and just continuously throw knives. As soon as the knife hits you, they can throw another. And when they're that close, it just happens so rapidly, you can lose a life very quickly with the knife throwers. They are probably the worst enemies in the game. And that is the manual for Kung Fu Master. 
Now, the cartridge is just black and white. Absolute was really uh, cheap, I think, with the cartridges, at least for the 7800 versions of the games. I remember uh, the skateboarding and title match pro wrestling on the 2600 actually had graphics. But here, all it says is Kung Fu Master in their kind of oriental style uh, font for the Atari 7800 used for joystick controller for one or two players. So the kind of the stuff you'd expect on the box is on the cartridge. The biggest difference between this cartridge and the 2600 version is I think the 2600 version has like a square around the word Kung Fu Master where this font is bigger and there's no square containing the word uh, Kung Fu Master. Graphically speaking, I actually didn't think the graphics were that super. Your characters are really small, especially when you compare them to the NES version. I thought they could probably beef them up. When you look at the screen, about maybe one third of the screen is used for all your status bars and maybe two thirds are used for the gameplay feel, but some of the gameplay feel is not playable. So only about half of your screen is like the playable area and you're like the size of half of that screen. So you're pretty tiny. They could have done a better job with that, but you can tell what all the characters are and what they're doing. And there's also some decorations in the backgrounds. They got like these uh, weird frames on several of the walls where the NES version just has basically blue walls. So I guess there is a little bit of improvement on that side, but I thought it could have looked better, to be honest with you. Music wise, it does a fair job of uh, sounds and music and doing the Kung Fu Master theme. And you, d you do have music going throughout the game as you are fighting your player. So that's kind of cool that you have music going on throughout. Not all 7800 games have music going on throughout. So I thought the music and sounds did a fair job for what they were supposed to do. Rarity Rise, both Atari Age and Digital Press give this game a 4, making it a slightly rare game. And it does cost a little bit on eBay. When I was looking, it looked like loose copies generally go for about $25 to $30. There was no complete copies available for sale. So this sounds like a game that only collectors get, and once they get it, they don't let go of it easily. New copies that were still sealed were available, and they went for about $65 to $85 was their price, but there was one that sold for like $175. Now, sometimes you have to be kind of wary when you see it, because just because an uh, auction was completed on eBay, it says it was complete, doesn't mean the person actually paid. So sometimes when you see these outrageous prices, it doesn't mean that the person paid. At the same token, when you see these really low prices and you're kicking yourself like, oh man, I wish I would have seen that and bid on it, it doesn't mean it, uh, it always sold. I've had times where I bought them Game's really cheap, but then the guy backs out because he wanted more money. So you got to kind of take it with a grain of salt. There was only one review, external review on Atari Age, and that had a score of 60%. So it wasn't highly uh, reviewed. Uh, as far as the high score club goes, the high score is held by Atomic Knee Drop, my nemesis who beat me at Double Dragon. And he has a score of 213,780. I did not have this game growing up, I actually had the 2600 version of the game. One of the reasons why I didn't buy a lot of the uh, absolute titles on 7800 too, they were hard to find sometimes. And another reason was my Toys R Us, would, where I bought most of my 7800 games, when they would get the games, they would cut out, you know, the front of the box and the back of the box and put in these slots so you could see the front and the back. But with the Absolute games, they didn't usually do that. And I'm guessing it's because the boxes were so much bigger, they didn't know how to cut them to fit, uh, fit the little flip cards, if you will. So I was very hesitant to buy a game where I couldn't even look at the box and I couldn't even see a screenshot. Now, this was in the days before the Internet. So for games like Kung Fu Master and the next one, Title Match Pro Wrestling, I never saw screenshots because none of the magazines really covered it, at least none of the ones I saw. And so uh, sadly, you know, I basically passed on a lot of the, the at least the 7800 absolute titles. I did buy some uh, 2600 versions 
and I did enjoy them. And yeah, I did. So I did have, I guess it was Activision. I had the 2600 version of Kung Fu Master, which came out, I believe, before this one, I, before I even knew there was going to be a 7800 version. And I did enjoy it, but I haven't played that in years, so I don't know how well that holds up. This game did appear in Atarian Magazine. Actually, all the Absolute games appear in Atarian Magazine, but only one time, and it's only in an ad. So I don't know if it's because they weren't Atari games that they weren't featuring them, but there was only one ad. It was inside the cover of the second issue. This is the same one, I think, that had the Gary Kitchen interview, so maybe that's why they had the ad in there, too. Maybe there was some sort of deal there. And it features all 6 700 games from Absolute. And it doesn't mention anything about the 2600 games, which they were still making, I believe, at that time, which is interesting because, you know, the Atari magazine was for the 2600, 7800, and the XE. The only uh, thing about this ad is basically it just shows you the six box shots. And I, I'll put this on my Facebook page if I haven't already, but it shows you all six boxes. But for Kung Fu, it says coming soon. It's the only one that says coming soon. And the box is still black in this ad and not red. So, that is that about the Atarian. So that is Kung Fu Master for the Atari 7800. Let's go on to Title Match Pro Wrestling. Title Match Pro Wrestling doesn't really have any background history. It wasn't based on an arcade game. There was the 2600 version that came out. I think it was in 1987. This version, I believe, came out in 1989, so two years later. On the title screen, it says it's actually Alex DeMio's title match, Pro Wrestling. I think Alex uh, programmed the first one, but this one also says that it's programmed by Mark Nichols. So I wonder if they gave Alex credit for kind of designing the concept, but Mark did most of the programming. At least that's that's where I'm getting at. Interestingly enough, I couldn't find anything on Kung Fu Master, which is kind of curious since a lot of these guys had tied to Activision, which was big about you know telling you who made the game and giving credit where it was due. But when it came to Absolute, they didn't always do that. So uh, kind of curious why they didn't do more credit there. Now the box of Title Match Pro Wrestling is actually pretty much exactly the same as the box of the 2600 version. It might have been larger in size, I'm not entirely sure, but at the front they do say Super Graphics for the Atari 7800 once again in a yellow box. So you have Title Match and kind of uh, silver, shiny metallic silver lettering, very similar to the old WWF logo kind of style of lettering then pro wrestling in kind of an orange color kind of written in underneath it and you have a guy wearing uh well this is very odd he's wearing yellow trunks and knee pads and wristbands very neon so you know something that you'd expect like a uh kind of a 90s punk uh rocker to do but he looks more like a street thug because he has a skull and crossbones tattoo over uh where his heart is on his chest and also a black tattoo, uh, looks like an anchor from the side on his skull, and he's completely bald. So it's like it's like Hulk Hogan uh, tights on a guy who is more like Stone Cold Steve Austin, if that makes sense. You can see the arena, lots of people in the background. You can see the cameraman. You can even tell that he has a mustache, which is kind of a nice feature. And anyways, the Stone Cold in Hulk Hogan uh, gear is jumping on a guy who is masked, with a black mask with uh, some blue highlights. He also has black uh, wristbands and trunks, it looks like, and blue knee pads. And he's very hairy. He's got a lot of chest hair on and some arm hair as well. So an interesting touch there. On the back, it says, The Contenders. And, in, uh, and it pops out with a starburst saying, saying, Featuring Tag Team. And you see the four guys. So you have a an African-American guy uh, with kind of a... I guess Jamaican style hair, if you will. Maybe he's supposed to be from Jamaican. You have the same guy who's on the cover back here. And this time you can see that he has like some sort of mom heart tattoo on the side. And then you have hairy chest guy with a mask. And then you have a Native American guy with some uh, various red uh, face paint and marks all over his body and a mohawk because as we know, all Native Americans had mohawks. It looks like they were basically trying to basically typecast uh, wrestlers. And I guess during this era, wrestlers were kind of typecasted uh, like this. The back also features two screenshots, one of the select character screen and one of the action itself in a tag team match. 
and there is a belt, a champion absolute belt, which is ironic. They have a championship belt, but you cannot get a championship belt in the game. So kind of interesting there. And it says, ladies and gentlemen, announcing the most competitive wrestling event to be played on the in the Atari 7800 arena. Tonight's the night title match is here. State of the art animation combined with realistic sound effects to give you all the excitement of professional wrestling. Choose from some of the meanest wrestlers in the business to compete one-on-one or tag team. Either way, the action never stops. Make all the pro moves like headlocks, airplane spins, rope dives, and body slams. And when you think you're really good, enter the ring against the computer to see who's the absolute champion. So you have to wait until you're really, really good to try the game. I don't get that part, but oh well. Let's go on to the manual. The manual, again, is black and white, uh, and it's uh, probably stapled, and it features a whopping 12 pages uh, pages this time. On the front, you have a black and white version of the cover art, and then it says, uh, Tonight's the night. The screams of the crowd shake the arena as the title belt contenders circle one another. This is a good setup, but I really don't like the fact that they bring up a title belt that you can't win. Mad Dog makes his first move, smashing his fist into Skinhead's chest, who gasps for air and then retaliates with a shin-cracking kick. Mad Dog growls and, grabbing from behind, drags Skinhead across the, uh, the across the ring, whipping him around in the airplane spin. By the way, when they say airplane spin, uh, what they mean is just kind of holding your opponent's arm and throwing them around around like has never happened in in uh, professional wrestling. I don't really remember that happening. I, maybe that was an older move. I know that there was like a a thing where you could put them on your shoulders and kind of spin around. I think some people call that an airplane spin, but th- this is not it. Letting go, he flies into the ropes, ropes and bounces back to meet Mad Dog's concrete forearm, forearm across his neck. A perfectly executed clothesline. Forearm. Is, isn't forearm the front? Because I thought clothesline happened in the back. Wasting no time, Mad Dog elbow drops him. Skinhead's face winces in pain as he fights his way up and staggers to his corner to tag his partner in. Big Chief takes the tag, grabs Mad Dog, lifting him over his head and body slams him into the mat. Mad Dog's stunned and he's not getting up. Big Chief, looking for the pin, climbs to the ropes for a dive. As he lunges into the air, Mad Dog scrambles to his feet and Big Chief's sweaty red-skinned body splatters on the empty mat. And I don't know if you're supposed to say red-skinned. Uh, I guess that's not completely PC there. So an interesting description. I like some of the description. I mean, it's very vivid, but there's some things that are inaccurate. Pressing select will will cycle you through the match selections. Once you have selected a match, choose your wrestler to begin with player one, number one, the person using the left joystick. Move the joystick to highlight the selection and press the joystick button. Once your player number one is selected a wrestler, it's player's two turn. In a tag team match, the selection occurs twice. Contenders are from left to right. So they show you a picture of the guys again, the same from the back. So the first guy, the uh, African-American guy, is Mad Dog. He And I wonder, in the game, kind of reminded me a little bit of Junkyard Dog. Now, he doesn't look like it in the illustration, but maybe that's what they're going from. From Mad Dog, Louisiana, and weighing in at a whopping 390 pounds, this redneck husky vows to chew up and spit out anyone who tries to tangle with him, and he does not look like a redneck. Uh, the stone cold guy from the covers called Skinhead, which is, uh, I don't know, I probably would have chosen a different name. Weighing in at 265 pounds from Cowpoke, Idaho, this farm boy was brutally forced to shave his head after losing in a cow tipping contest. To overcome his humiliation, Skinhead turned to wrestling at the age of nine and, and today is one of the most feared wrestlers of our time. And this guy does not look like a farm boy at all. In the the first guy, if you see a picture of him, he does not look like he's nearly 400 pounds either. So it's kind of crazy where they're coming up with all these things. Mr. Mean, currently weighing in at 320 pounds from, Hobo- from Hoboken, New Jersey. Mr. Mean acquired virtually all of his early training on the streets to defend himself against slime. And I guess they're just calling the other people slime in New Jersey. And Mr. Mean is the uh, guy who wears the mask. Big Chief, one part Apache and one part Hulk from Big River, Utah. He is merciless at 420 pounds. Big Chief powwow doesn't miss a trick. He will crush you without a second's thought. All right. 
Once a contender has been chosen, the arena screen is displayed. The match can begin at any point during the gameplay. You can press restart to, re to uh, uh, restart the currently selected match. Taking the belt. Why are they talking about the belt? You cannot win the belt in this game. Each wrestler's strength is displayed by power bars on the scoreboard. The upper bar represents the strength of wrestler number one. The lower bar of wrestler number two. Your challenge will be to sustain your strength while depleting your opponent's strength. Used in combination with skillful maneuvering will enable you to pin your opponent. Next to each wrestler's power bar is a digit representing how many times the opposition has fallen. Pinning your opponent for a three count constitutes a fall. The rule for winning the match is the best out of three falls. So the first person to win two matches is officially the winner. It's a two out of three falls match. You can't change that. All right, hang on to your hats because this is where it gets even more confusing. Your controls. There are two modes of joystick control during gameplay. The first is joystick mode, which simply is moving your joystick around. So if you're not pressing the buttons, it's joystick mode. Your wrestler's movement or pattern will correspond to that of your joystick. The second is button mode. To switch from joystick into button mode, you first must release the joystick, then press the button and use one of the four joystick positions to execute a, mu a move. To use button mode in succession, you must release both the button and the joystick and press the button and move the joystick again. The following instructions will refer to button mode as either button mode up, down, left, or right. And as you can tell, I'm already not liking this game because it sounds too complicated and this game moves very fast and it sounds like you're constantly using your joystick and not. But let's go on. Softening your opponent. Once the match begins, your wrestler can walk around the ring in joystick mode. Make your wrestler punch with button mode up. Kick with button mode down. You can soften your opponent with these moves by knocking down his strength while maintaining your own. And let me tell you that in this game, you can very, very quickly uh, deplete both your bar and your enemy's bar. It, it happens very quickly. Literally, you can play the game for 10 seconds and the bars will already be depleted. It, it's, it, it's really interesting. The headlock. With the exception of punching and kicking, you must first grab your opponent into a headlock before making the move against them. Do this by moving your wrestler right next to the opponent, release the joystick in button mode, and grab by directing your joystick toward the opponent. To release the opponent, you must reactivate button mode, this time directing the joystick toward your own wrestler. Once you have them captured your opponent in a headlock, you can drag him around the ring in joystick mode using the button mode to using button mode down, canvas slams your opponent. So this is very difficult to pull off and it was in the 2600 version as well it might be a little easier in the 7800 version but it's still a hard thing to do so basically what you have to do is push towards with your joystick and the button at the same time in order to grab them this is another frustration i have just like with the previous game kung fu master you have a two button joystick please use the second button but they don't they just copy the 2600 moves which were hard enough I wish they would have made the second button a grab button or a headlock button because what often happens is this game is fast and furious. The computer will just wail on you very quickly and pick you up as quick as he can. He can. It moves so quickly that you, you'll end up moving your joystick quickly and constantly pressing the button. So in order to get them in a headlock, you have to press towards and the button at the same time and be perfectly placed, which for me was very difficult to do. I rarely got them in a headlock, and when I did, it felt like luck. The best luck I had when was when I was slightly above him, not in the same level and towards his head, but it was still a very difficult thing to do. But what, but what often happens is, is that uh, you'll be pushing the button so fast is that you'll get them in a headlock and do something before you even realize it. And this is very frustrating. Anyways, let's go on. Around he goes. While you have him in a headlock, direct a joystick towards your opponent in button mode to swing him into an airplay spin. Switch your joystick mode by releasing the button and throw your opponent. You could swing your opponent just... Uh, just a little to bounce him off the ropes or swing around many times and then let go to send him bouncing off the ropes and then flying back across the ring. When your opponent bounces off the ropes, get in his path and press the button before he passes to clothesline him and knock him to the canvas. Note, when caught in a headlock, you must use muscle mode to generate extra power you need to ex uh, escape see muscle mode. And they'll talk about muscle mode in a minute. So basically, you grab your opponent when you have him in a headlock and you rotate your joystick around and you're just spinning him around. And then when you, when you let go, he bounces off the ropes. If you do it longer, he bounces farther. And you can try and do a clothesline, but this is near impossible to do. He's flying high to power lift your opponent, get him into a headlock and use button mode up. Once he's overhead, use the joystick mode to carry your opponent around the ring. Use button mode up and you can backdrop and pin your opponent or use button mode down for a body slam. Carry your opponent to one of the top corners of the ring and use button mode 
down to throw him out of the ring. And you know what? I think this is an error because I could never throw my opponent out of the ring. I don't think this is possible because I don't even think it tells you how to get back into the ring. I've never seen it happen. Maybe it's possible, but I've never given it. No, I was never able to uh, throw him out of the ring. He's down. With your opponent down in joystick mode, you can walk freely around the ring. Position your wrestler right next to the opponent to use button mode up to power lift him. Use uh, button mode left or right to grab him in a headlock. Use button mode down to elbow drop and pin your opponent. When your wrestler is down, he can use muscle mode to, dren- to generate additional strength you need to get back up. See muscle mode. Well, let me explain it, even though the manual will go over it. Muscle mode is just jiggling your joystick left and right. Uh, several times as quick as possible. Kind of like when in Kung Fu Master you get uh, hugged by one of the guys, you have to go left and right. Same thing with this game. So if you're getting pinned, go left and right quickly and you might escape it. If you're getting picked up or in a headlock, go left and right, you might break free of it. But if you're pinning the guy, you want to use the muscle mode going left and right to help keep him pinned down to the ground. He's up on the ropes. If your opponent is down and you are away from him, at the very top or bottom of the ring, you can climb onto the ropes by using button mode up. I hope I, you know, after this, I hope to never say button mode again. Once on the ropes, joystick mode left or right allows you to walk back and forth. Use the button mode down to climb off the ropes or use button mode up again to do a rope dive and pin your opponent. And I was able to pull this off, but it is very difficult to do. Switching with tag team partners when competing in a tag team match, move your wrestler to the corner at the bottom of the ring and use button mode down to switch your tag partners. A good time to do this is when your strength is down. By the way, please don't don't anyone ever say button mode again. I, I'm really getting irritated by button mode. Oh, I've had enough button mode. I want to button mode this game off. But remember that your partner must be at maximum strength in order to switch. You can tell that your partner's strength is up by walking to your corner. If your partner attempts to follow you, he has fully regained his strength. So when you're close to him, if he kind of goes left and right with you, that means you can tag him. There are signs I try to take my partner and he couldn't. And there's no bar, so you can't see if how much strength he has. You just have to wait till he moves. Muscle mode. When your opponent is down or in a headlock, he can escape by using muscle mode into action. Muscle mode is executed by jiggling the joystick left and right very fast. Jiggling the joystick. Everybody say jiggling the joystick 10 times fast. Provides extra strength to be used in combination with the wrestler's already existing strength. The following are situations which you will find it necessary to utilize muscle mode. When your opponent has gotten you in a headlock, if your strength combined with your extra power from using muscle modes exceeds the strength of your opponent, you can break away. For example, if you have more strength than your opponent and he grabs you, minimal muscle mode will be needed to break away. To get back up when you're down the canvas, if you already have at least half your strength, little muscle will be needed to get back up. With less than half, you must work harder in muscle mode to get it up. When you are pinned, if your strength is combined with an extra muscle generated by using muscle mode, exceeds your opponent, you will succeed in escaping. When you have your opponent pinned, in this situation, muscle mode is used offensively. This is muscle mode competition in which you and the aggressor are trying to maintain your pin for three seconds while your opponent is trying to escape. (sighs) Done with muscle mode, hopefully, for my life. And then, just to rub it in your face, they show a picture of the championship absolute belt, which you cannot win. Some strategic advice from the experts. Keep in mind that certain offensive moves, such as power lifting and holding your opponent in airplane spin for extended period of time, will use up a lot of your own strength while increasing your opponent's. That makes no sense. That makes no sense. Your opponent's strength will increase while you're doing something to them. Try to use the less expensive moves, such as punching and kicking to soften up your opponent so that when it comes time, you'll have enough strength to pin him. Pin your opponent unexpectedly to get a head start in muscle mode competition. Okay, so wait till you have enough strength to pin him, but then pin him unexpectedly to get a head start. This is like very, you know, counterintuitive. In tag team competition, if you know that your opponent's tag partner is weak, throw your opponent out of the ring. I've never seen them. Can you do that? If anyone's done this, show me. I I want to see this. This will force a partner into the ring, allowing you to take advantage of the competition's weakened condition. So I guess it's possible, but not in. I haven't seen it in either version of the game, the 2600 or 7800. In tag team competition, if you know that your opponent is weak, guard his corner to prevent him from switching to tag team partners. Good luck with that. Um, and I'll say this too, in tag team mode, you cannot play with, you know, two people on the same team. If you play two players, it's always against each other. And then if it wasn't confusing enough, they give you a chart that shows you how to move the joystick and everything else in order to do all these moves. This game is way too complicated. And then you have the warranty information. So uh, thanks for hanging with me. That's the manual of uh, title match pro wrestling. Wrestling games should be 
simple. You know, it should be easy to pick up and play. I remember in the arcade, I don't know who put it out, but there was this, I think it was called the main event. And and it was a wrestling game, I think up to four players. I think there's four joysticks. But they really simplified it, but it was fun. You had four characters you could select from, and you had this big button. That's all it was, was a joystick and one massive button. And you just wailed on the button to do to do moves. And it, and it actually was very entertaining, and it was slow-paced. This game is just way too fast-paced as well. It just goes way too quickly, and it can be very frustrating. But I'll... I'll I'll share my thoughts on this a little bit later on. Let's let's go on to the graphics. Well, let's talk about the cartridge first. The cartridge, like the uh, like Kung Fu Master, is just you know it just says title match pro wrestling. There is no graphics. It's a black cartridge. It's an Activision style cartridge, and uh, you know outside of I like Activision cartridges. I like how you can stack them on one another, but the label is nothing inspiring at all. All right. So graphically speaking, actually, I thought the game looked really good. I thought it, for the seventy hundred, it was quite impressive. All the wrestlers are enormously huge, like they're totally on a bunch of steroids. And if you look closely, you can kind of tell that they just took the same guy and did some palette swaps and, uh, you know, added a mask or changed the skin color. I mean, the Big Chief is really red. I mean, he's really red. Mad Dog um, is, well, they, they're showing the wrong guy in this one. It, sh- it shows that Mad Dog is uh, like white, but skinhead is darker and Mr. Mean is um the mask guy I'm, I'm just looking at screenshots at atari age so i can't remember if i played it i i thought they i thought it looked a little different anyways so maybe skinhead is the, scar- the darker guy in this game maybe that's a mistake i'm not sure anyways going on uh when so you got your characters by the way they look a lot like a bobo from the 7800 version of double dragon like they're related but i think they look better they they move very well they look well and actually having these nice looking sprites helps the game uh, improve from the 2600 version where the sprites are not very detailed at all you have your arena that looks pretty nice actually um you can you see this huge crowd people are like have their hands up in the air and you can tell that they're just really into it you can see a camera guy you can see green steps that lead up to the ring even though you can't go up the steps and it, it looks very good now it's static it doesn't move at all it would be nice if there was some animation in the crowd but you know i'll take what i can get the ring looks pretty good too there's an absolute logo in the middle and it looks like a wrestling ring. And there's a little, you know, your health, your two health bars on top for you and the second player are on what basically is like a an arena scoreboard. So overall, graphically, I thought it looks pretty good. And it looks good in motion as well, too. It's just very hard to control. Uh, an interesting thing, too, is that, um, first of all, in tag team matches, you're the two tag team guys who aren't, aren't in the ring just stand at the bottom of the screen on opposite corners. They're not, you know, on the on the ring like in traditional wrestling. And uh, when you win a match or when somebody wins the match, they do a dance. So if it's just one guy, he kind of moves around the the ring by himself. But if it's a tag team, it looks like they're like on Dancing with the Stars. They're dancing around with each other, which is hilarious because it's like these big muscle bound wrestlers. And they're doing like this girly dance around the ring. It's very, very bizarre to watch but that's the graphics i thought the graphics in this game actually look really good and i thought the sound effects uh did a good job as well as far as serving their purpose now basically i think it's just the 2600 version but it's amazing when you combine sounds with better graphics it actually makes it seem like the sounds are better than they are at least that's my opinion sometimes you know if you're looking at something you can be like wow these sounds are pretty good i also think it goes to show that people were getting a lot more out of the 2600 sound uh later on in the life where you could actually say, wow, this sound looks, this sound sounds really good. It sounds like 7800 sound when it's really just 2600 sound. But the sound effects, you know, they're, they're simple, but they serve their purpose. And that's for about that. You know, nothing great, but it does what it's supposed to do. And just like Kung Fu Master, both Atari Age and Digital Press give these give Title Match Pro Wrestling a rarity for. 
on eBay, all I could find was loose copies. I could not find any complete copies or any new sealed copies, and they averaged about 16 bucks. And there was only one review on Atari Age, and that was for a 40% out of 100 score. And, the, and because all you do is pin, there's no score, there is no high score club. I did not have this game either as a kid. As a kid, I was a, I was a pretty big wrestling fan. I really liked the WWF during this time. And uh, I, I would have wanted to buy it if I could have saw the box. And I may have bought it if I could, see, could have seen the box. I think I saw, like the again, the Toys R Us display with just the name in black, Title Match Pro Wrestling. But I was scared to buy it without looking at it. And I was tempted by the 2600 version too, but I never picked that up as well. So that is Title Match Pro Wrestling. Ah, I'm just winded from that manual. I need some listener feedback. Let's go to the feedback. Now it's time for listener feedback. This is the part of the show where the listeners come to the rescue. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Over on Facebook.com, over on the Atari 7800 Game by Game podcast page, uh, I threw out a question. I said, name a game you wish was made for the 7800 during its lifetime. Got some good responses. Justin said he'd like to have seen a fun and simple pinball game, and I'm totally up with that i like video pinball games i know some people don't i I like real pinball tables as well and i'll also say this i didn't i don't think i mentioned it on the williams episode when i was talking about the company who also made lots of um, pinball tables when it came to joust but they have a really solid collection the hall of fame pinball collections both the gottlieb and williams they've been released on tons of the systems from the ps2 on and they're they're solid they're solid compilations of videoized versions of pinball games. Highly recommend those. Anyways, going on, Ferg from the Atari 2600 Game by Game podcast said, uh, Clax was made, but unfortunately it did not come out, and Ele- Elevator Action would have been a good one. So, yeah, definitely cool there. Ralph says, Space Duel. Sean said Millipede, which there is rumors over at Atari Age that a prototype has been found, but it's looking more and more like it's an April 1st prank. I'm recording this before April 1st, so we'll know more about that later, but it was on the docket to be made, but never did get made. And then Ed from Ed Laden said Sinistar, Elevator Action, and Space Dungeon. And uh, I'm going to end with a 5200 console so I can play Space Dungeon again. So yeah, a game that was ported to the 5200, but not the 7800. And then he adds another one. He says, oh yeah, and Mr. Do, LOL. And LOL, from now on, Mr. Do is banned from this programming. If you say Mr. Do, it will not be fully allowed on the show. You can try, but it will not happen. All right, so that was some fun over there. Let's go on and get feedback for today's games. When I rate games on this show, I like to do use a scale of four different ratings. The best rating would be a Hall of Fame game. That would be a top five game on the system. Then come solid games, followed by meh games, and then finally trash games, which to me would be a bottom five game on this system. So let's see what people had to say over on Facebook um, Ferg said both a meh for me, but only because I don't care for these types of games. And he also threatened to unseal his copy of Kung Fu Master, which, uh, I said would just make collectors everywhere gasp. Matt said that he never played these, but the label art gets a zero and that, yeah, that it does. The, the absolute games on the 2600, the early ones looked pretty good, but the rest of the label arts were really bland. And uh, Ferg says, you have to admit, though, it's consistent. And Matt replies, they have been they have a very business like quality to them. No fancy pants fonts or pictures for us. Thanks. Just the titles. And don't let me catch you using any colors. We aren't trying to attract the wrong element with these games. So very observant there. Greg from the SNES podcast said Kung Fu Master, a game I love both in the arcade and the NES but the 7800 port just gets a meh for me. Sorry, much better done on the NES, and I'm going to agree with that. Uh, Title Match Pro Wrestling also gets a meh, but it's more due to not being a wrestling fan. Kudos to Absolute for supporting the system, though, when few companies would due to the monopoly on the NES. So in order to get more feedback, I came up with the idea of posting a thread over at Atari Age over under the Atari 7800 
uh, section to see what would happen. And actually, I got some good responses. So let's see what people had to say over at Atari Age. For uh, Greg, 2600 says, Kung Fu Master is a meh. For me, it's okay, but I was never a fan of the arcade either. In fact, I hated it. Title match is trash, like every other pro wrestling game back then. Just so difficult to control. I think some people would argue that uh, the wrestling game on the NES, the first one, was a good one, but I'm not really experienced with that, so I can't say for myself. Atomic Knee Drop says, My brother and I did the old lemonade stand thing to earn money to buy title match when we were kids in the late 80s. I believe we acquired Ikari Warriors in a similar fashion. Very cool. Oh, the memories. As far as the game itself, Title Match leaves a lot to be desired. Still, I'm nostalgic for it, and I do still play it once in a while. I'd give it a meh to balance my own emotions with the gameplay. And that's true. It's it's interesting how games we owned we want to rate higher just because of the nostalgia factor. And I'm sure several of you experienced this if you owned games growing up when you could only have a limited number that even the bad games became kind of good because you had no no other choice. You just had to learn to appreciate them and kind of get the nuances with bad controls or whatever you had to deal with. Kung Fu Master came later during the eBay era. I believe it was one of the last five or so original 7800 games I had to purchase for my collection to be basically complete. I think only Mean 18, Take Command, and Motorcycle came later for me. I do like it, but it seems like it should have had it should have utilized the second button. No biggie, somewhere between meh and salad, and I can understand where you're going with that. Drac is back, says I ranked title match low meh heading towards the trash and Kung Fu Master a high meh leaning slightly towards salad. And I totally understand that. Sean says they both are subpar. Two out of five scores on both. Uh, Thursday 83 says title match stinks. He's a little more colorful, but I'll keep it a little more family friendly here. Just my own personal uh, thing. Basically, when it comes to words, if I don't want my kids to say it, I'm not going to say it. So that's just what I'm going to do. So much potential, so awful gameplay and programming. I've said on this forum for years how I wanted a playable and decent wrestling game for the system. Something with a goal of sorts and something that is halfway near pro wrestling for the NES, which for their first effort was stellar. Kung Fu Master is fine. The graphics are decent. Other than the easy fixes that could have been made, the body's uh, falling off like the arcade, the jump kick, etc. and so on. So for title match, he calls it trash, and Kung Fu Master, he uh, gives it a salad, it looks like. There is an article on Kung Fu Master in the current issue of Retro Gamer, which landed on my nook today. Rated the 78 High version pretty highly, and that came from Johnny British, so that's cool to know. Let's see, Jeremiah JT says, I have never spent enough time with Title Match Pro Wrestling to give it any kind of score. I think I played it when I got it and then put it away after I made sure it worked. Kung Fu Master is a different story. I never played it in the arcade, but I was a fan of Kung Fu on the NES from way back. And I'm guessing most people, that's how they played Kung Fu. I, I don't even know if I've ever seen an arcade game, but I digress. I got a 2600 Kung Fu Master first, and I enjoyed that one quite a bit. I was really impressed what they pulled off on the 2600, as was I. When I first played the 7800 version, the first thing I noticed was the control was the exact same as the 2600 version. They did not even change the controls to take advantage of the second button. Outside of that, I think it's a fun game, but the one button control has always irked me. And I would rate it a solid game, even with the control scheme being ridiculous. And yes, I agree, I, I don't like the one button thing. And then King Atari. Haven't played 7800 title match, but I do have... 7800 Kung Fu Master. I like the game in general. I've played quite a bit of the NES version over the years, and I even have the Japan-only Famicom sequel, cool, which is a blast, but objectively speaking, the 7800 port is, upon first glance, a bit underwhelming. First and foremost, it plays, and of course sounds, exactly like the 2600 version. Only the graphics have been upgraded. Only one button is used for attacking, and the enemies merely disappear when hit. It really does feel like the 2600 version except with a fresh coat of paint. The 2600 port is good, but the 7800 is capable of so much more. And to add insult to injury, the character sprites are really on the ugly side. And I'll interject here. You know, I really enjoyed growing up as a kid the uh, the, the skateboarding games I had from Absolute. I had both the 2600 and 7800 versions. And I had F-14 Tomcat. I think that was the other one. I really liked them. And that was for the 2600. 
didn't really have anything else for the 7800 from the system. And what I've experienced so far, and we'll see because I haven't played all the games yet, is it does seem like what you said about they just basically take the 2600 game and add a fresh coat of paint and that's it. And I'm starting to see that. And that's kind of tainting my taste for the absolute games. I used to think they were awesome, but now I'm like, why were you so lazy with the 7800 version? Why didn't you do uh, two button controls for like the games today? I think you're dead on where they just added the graphics, but they kept everything else the same. Lazy programming, in my opinion, but let's go on. But you know what? Even though it doesn't take more advantage of the 7800's power, the uh, Kung Fu Master still manages, manages to be pretty fun. The one button limitation is really a blessing since that means you can bypass the risk killing pro line joysticks and use something, anything that's infinitely more comfortable. That is true. The sound is a wash. Kung Fu Master never had that much going for it sound wise in the first place. So unless you want the digi digitized voice bits from the arcade and the NES versions, which are cool, but not exactly a deal breaker, the 7800 version doesn't really sound too bad. Graphically, the character sprites may be blockier and uglier than those found in the NES version. Given the 1989 release date, they really should have been better on the front here, and I agree. But the backgrounds are actually better and much more detailed on 7800. Yes, they are. And even though defeated enemies simply disappear, looks pretty lazy, it's not something that hurts the core gameplay, which is fast-paced and fun. I might feel a bit loose, especially when compared to the NES port, but it's definitely playable and, as far as I'm concerned, pretty addictive. It's not a masterpiece, and there are better versions out there, but 7800 Kung Fu Master is still, in my opinion, a pretty solid game and a good, though not great, representation of the arcade original. If someone doesn't like any iteration of Kung Fu Master, the 7800 version probably won't change their mind, but fans of the game, such as myself, should find it an acceptable port. Though, to be honest... I am a beat-em-up junkie, and the 7800 is a bit starved in that department, so Kung Fu Master may very well rate higher with me than it would someone else. And I and, you know, I can totally see where you're coming from that. And that was the Atari Age forum feedbacks. Thank you, guys. I really, really appreciated it. I, I was really concerned about not getting a lot of feedback for these games from for the show because they're rare, more obscure. So very grateful for your help, for your help. So thanks, Atari Age, for coming through for me today. Let's go on into the emails and see what I got. By the way, I'm going to start a new contest with the emails. I'm going to take a little bit of the page from the Retro League, and I'm going to have a listener of the month. And what I think I'm going to do is basically I'm going to give you um, points or entries if you email me a response. If you give me a text email for um, a game that I, I'm covering or have covered, uh, send me a text email. I'll give you one entry for each one of those you send. And if you send me an audio submission, I'll give you two entries for that. Now, this is just going to be for people in the U.S. because I'm going to ship out the, the games. Um, so sorry to any friends across the ponds or in other countries, but I need to keep costs low. And what I'm going to do, it's not going to be anything big, but I'll just give you a list of some uh, doubled copies of video games I have. Uh, right now, I have a bunch of extra 2600 games, which you can play on your 7800. I might have some 7800 titles too, but I'll just give you a list of my doubles. And if you see anything you want, if you win, you can uh, pick a game off the list, basically, and I'll mail it to you. And I'll do that at the end of each month. So uh, be sure to send in those uh, audio submissions and text submissions. And uh, yeah, I'll let you know. We'll see how that goes, but I'll try that. So anyways, let's go to the mailbag. Okay, first of all, I heard from Lewis on Galaga and stuff. And he says, hi, Phil, I love your podcast. and I listen to it on the way to work. Thank you. Anyway, I heard the feature on Galaga and I felt like I had to chime in on my disappointment with it. Though it does play a really decent game of Galaga, it comes off to me feeling like a rush port and not all that it could have been. Here are some additional complaints aside from what was already mentioned. The ship is entirely the wrong shape. Maybe it's just the resolution, but the arcade ship had swept back wings and an angular body. The 7800 ship looks like it has wings sticking straight to the side in a round body. I can't help but think that even with the lower resolution of the 7800, they could have come up with a better likeness. The song is not only off key, which I know can't be entirely avoided unless a pokey is on board, but it's missing the last three notes. It would have been less jarring had the music not ended with a solid beep sound and after those nice echo tones too. 
Of all the things that bugged me about this ver- this version, this may be the thing that really sticks out to me the most, and I think you and Ferg might agree on that. As the enemies are entering the screen, the game can actually get choppy. Watch the movement of the, of the enemies as they spin around the screen. This may only really be noticeable on expert mode because they are faster, and you might be uh, right there because I, uh, I'm not good at the game, so I didn't play on expert mode. I also remember from previous plays some oddly long pauses. I did notice this time that the enemies uh, warp in the while warp in while the music is still playing, which I don't believe happens in the arcade. All in all, it's a decent port, but not quite up to the NES one in most respects. Although I do appreciate the difficult the difficulty settings as well. So the NES is more arcade perfect, but for those of you who don't know, it doesn't have any uh, different difficulties than the 7800 does. One nice detail that it, this has, which the NES is missing, is that the enemies drift apart and back together when in formation, just like the arcade. Interesting. But yeah, this port is unfortunately, in my opinion, not up to the quality level of 7800's Food Fight, Joust, or Dig Dug. I was also, oh great, I was also happy to hear Mr. get a mention on the podcast. I never paid it much attention, but the other day I was at a friend's house by coincidence and we fired up the SNES version. This was before I got to listen to the podcast. It is so fast paced and hyperactive, I think that I'll have trouble going back to Dig Dug now. Keep making the cool podcast and videos. And that's from Lewis Lewis. Thank you very much. And you had to bring up that game, didn't you? I did get a audio submission from Sean. And Sean, thank you very much. But it's going to be for next week's game. So I'm going to save it till next week. But it's time for everyone's favorite part. That, of course, is Shinto Says. Let's see what Shinto Says today. I do not own Kung Fu Master for the 7800. It's actually the only Absolute Games 7800 title that I don't have. I've got the 2600 version, though, and uh, I'll forever associate that with my brother's cheesy, faux-Japanese-accented pronunciation of the title. But I I never really got into that game. I checked eBay and GameGavel to see what the going rate was for the 7800 Kung Fu Master uh, prior to the fill effect kicking in. Fill effect, you heard it here first. But, but it ain't pretty. I'm not a serious collector, uh, so yeah, I'm going to have to pass. Title match pro wrestling, though, I, I did have growing up, and I will drone on about that for a bit. There was a brief period in my life when I watched professional wrestling, and now I'm glad my wife doesn't listen to this podcast. It wasn't a long time, mind you, but it did happen to coincide with title match pro wrestling arriving on the market. Most of the time when playing this with my brother, I think it was more about taking turns trying out the fancy moves and was actually competing with each other. There was at least one time in early 1991 where we honestly played against each other, me losing the match, and that fact recorded in the high score binder. My brother, 1-0, to zero, me, 0-1. Zero to one. Very helpful there, high score binder. Thank you for that. There was a small grocery store a few miles from where we lived, uh, much closer than the chain supermarket, so we would ride our bikes there on occasion to buy candy or whatever. They sold video games at this place too, but annoyingly, they only carried Nintendo games. No Atari, no Sega Master System. There was a professional wrestling game there for the NES. I, I don't remember what it was called, but we would compare the screenshots on the back of that box with what we had in Title Match, convinced, of course, that the 7800 game was better. It is pretty decent in terms of graphics. Sounds, though, is, is this the game with the annoying whistling sound in the audience? Man, that was obnoxious. I didn't play this game in preparation for this week's episode. I, I kind of wanted to keep my memories of it, such as they are, as pristine as possible. I will admit, though, to a tinge of nostalgia, just a tinge, looking at the screenshots on Atari Age. Oh yeah, culturally insensitive Native American stereotype. I remember that guy. But looking back, I, I don't think this was that great of a game. Certainly not Hall of Fame material. Probably not even solid, either. I'm So I'm going to go with meh for my rating. It's not trash. I mean, it apparently had sufficient merit for me to defend it against an inanimate NES game box. And, and the graphics aren't bad. I remember spinning people around and throwing them out of the ring and climbing the ropes. And, and that was fun, I suppose. But I'm in no way compelled to plug in the cartridge and relive those days. It And that whistling sound. I think that whistling sound still haunts me. <laughs> There is 
no fill effect. For those of you who don't know, Ferg of the Atari uh, 2600 has this phenomenon happening called the Ferg effect, where when he brings up a game, the prices on eBay tend to go up. So if you want to get a good deal on a game, be sure you get it before the Ferg effect happens. Where on my show, when I cover a game, the prices go up about a nickel. So it's <laughs> there's not. I don't think there's any fill effect yet. Um, especially with these games, they're already rare enough as they are. If it, if anything ever happens, that'll just knock me, uh, knock me off the stool, so, so to speak. But, uh, no, that's not going to happen. I, I, I totally dig the, the high score notebook one and O and O and one. Thank you. High score notebook. Really great. Shinto is awesome. And I'm sure whenever he does a podcast, it's going to be awesome as well. He's been a big supporter of the Atari, uh, podcasts of all sorts, shapes, and sizes, and we all appreciate him. All right, so that is it for listener feedback. If you ever want to send it to me, you can send it to Atari7800podcast at AOL.com, Atari7800podcast at AOL.com. Welcome, you got mail. Kind of retro there, and remember, I will put some entries in for you, and uh, I would totally appreciate that. And I'm feeling really lazy today. So next week's games are going to be Pole Position 2 and Miss Pac-Man. And the following weeks are going to be games I haven't covered yet. Okay. So if you have feedback for Miss Pac-Man or Pole Position 2, please send it in. And if you have feedback for any of the games I've covered, like Galaga and Jouster, Food Fighter, Dig Dug, or any of the games I've covered so far, just general 7800 memories, you can send them in as well. I totally appreciate that. You can also leave a review over at iTunes. I just got another five-star review, and I really like those. I don't claim that this is a five-star show, but on iTunes, it's basically five stars or nothing from what I understand. Like, if you get anything lower than that, they knock you down. So if you'd like to support the show, feel free and write a review. I would appreciate that we try to get better around here we really do and um yeah i think that's just about it but i did want to extend a welcome i'm a member of the retro junkies network and we had a new birth in the family the atari 5200 super podcast that's right the atari 5200 has got its own podcast finally so now the middle child is finally getting some recognition it deserves. Now, for those of you who don't know, the 5200 uh, system is extremely huge, weighs about two tons, so it takes two hosts, not one. So Willie and RK, RK, who I believe is new to the podcasting arena, but is doing a solid job. They just released episode zero, uh, I think like a week or two ago, and uh, next their next episode is going to cover Pac-Man and um, Breakout. So uh, if you, you know, interested in the 5200, even if you don't have the system, check it out. Of course, always check out Atari, um, the Atari 2600 game by game podcast with Ferg 2. And that's basically all the home councils that are currently being uh, covered. We're all members of the Retro Junkies Network and we're all one big happy family. Yay. All right, guys, I'll try and get the next episode out in about a week and a half. So be sure to get in your feedback quickly. This episode came out late, so I'm going to try and catch up. Thanks again, guys. Remember, games are fun, but always keep first things first. See you next time. You have been listening to the Atari 7800 Game by Game podcast. But you already knew that, didn't you? The Atari 7800 Game by Game podcast is part of the Retro Junkies Network. Blah 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 copyright 2015 blah blah blah. I really need to find a better job. I wonder if Ferg is hiring. So one of the women that made the cookies used to smoke while she was making the cookies. Oh, uh-oh. And you could actually taste the smoke. Oh, gross. <laughs> I kind of like that. Oh. <laughs> I thought it was interesting. Uh.